So hello and, uh, and welcome to the uh, 2020 Urology Foundation guest lecture. Uh, my name is Ben Chalakam. I'm the uh, current chair of the uh, BAS section of oncology. And uh, we have got a really uh, unique and exciting uh, lecture for you today, which is really going to be a, a discussion with a um, amazing chap. Uh, you'll have seen it advertised and we're going to speak to Alex Corbiziero. He is uh, England and British Lions uh, loosehead prop, played for the London Irish in Northampton. Uh, he's about my height, but uh, as you would imagine, he's not exactly my pigeon weight. Alex weighs in on, on his Wikipedia page, 124 kilos. So Alex was a, a, a massive uh, player for England for, a, I think he got over 30 caps. Uh, but sadly, last year, Alex uh, was diagnosed with testicular cancer and, uh, and has been on quite a journey with that. So I think we'll, uh, if we get, ask Alex to, uh, to switch on, it would be uh, lovely to, uh, to start the, the chat. Alex, can you hear me? Uh, yep. Hi, everyone. How are we all doing? Um, ben, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And it's a pleasure to be here talking to everyone. And thank you for that lovely introduction as well. And uh, yeah, let's get started and get into it. Great. Well, I'm uh, your... You don't know my rugby prowess, but I, I'm not very good at rugby. But I have, I am currently the president of the oldest rugby club in the world, which is Guy's Hospital Rugby Club. And if I don't say that, the boys will never forgive me. But we were connected by my cousin, who is much better at rugby from, than me. And he's called Rupert Cox. And you and him uh, have presented some work at Sky Sports and at NBC, where you do a lot of the, the you're, the, you're the, uh, the pundit for them now, aren't you? Uh, exactly. So I've known Rupert for years and we'd worked together a bit in, in Sky Sports, especially when I first retired in, in 2016 because of injuries. But then obviously the last three, almost four years now, I've been working for NBC Sports in America and I predominantly cover um, a lot of the European rugby or the Northern Hemisphere rugby, but on, on American TV. And we had the World Cup as well in 2019. And because of the sort of co-ownership of NBC and Sky by their parent company, Cobcast, we were able to have Rupert and a few of the Sky Sports team over for the whole World Cup. So about seven weeks living in a hotel together. And that was just about literally a couple of weeks before I got diagnosed. And then right. luckily it just seemed to be right time, right place that, that Rupert could connect me with you as well. Well, I remember it actually. I was on the train back from the Baus Oncology meeting last year. We went down to uh, Brighton. We have one of these meetings where we we're all chatting and one of those uh, chats was about uh, management of, uh, of testis cancer. And then he rang me and said, I've got this, uh, this friend I'd like you to speak to. So at that stage, I think you'd, you'd just had your orchidectomy and that was done by Mr. Saab Sandhu at, uh, in Kingston. And we then were trying to get the info on that. And just for the, obviously the urology audience, I think it was, a, you had quite, you had a, like a hydrocele type situation with a lot of fluid around the testis. And you ended up with what we thought was a, a pure seminoma about four centimeters, and there was there's some equivocal reti testis invasion. Just taking you back to that, and um, we uh, were then deciding whether or not to watch and wait or give you that first cycle of uh, the single shot of carbo. And just tell me your thoughts about that at the time. Was that really difficult? Us putting that ball in your court a little bit? Yeah, no. So. First of all, thank you to Mr. Saab Sandhu for doing my, my orchidectomy and everything went to plan. I believe it was seven centimeters, just from memory. Yeah, I yeah. Think, think I have a photo to, uh, to, to prove yeah. as well. And, and that was one of the things that I first found challenging was the, the hydrocele sort of, sort of made it quite hard to detect the, the cancer initially. I think um, my, I we'll probably get onto it, but my father and uncle have both had cancer yeah. at a similar age to me. So I've always been quite aware of checking. And actually, when I was at London Irish, it was a time where I noticed my left testicle was a bit bigger than the right one. And they sent me off to have an ultrasound and scan. And they told me that you have a hydrocele in, in uh, the yeah. left testicle. And so it was always that testicle for always had been slightly bigger and slightly heavier than the other one. And I just kind of got used to that. It'd been checked a couple of times and been given the all clear. And that's what made it, I think, probably hard to first detect it was it wasn't until it got yeah. alarmingly big that then I realized, hey, there's something wrong because they couldn't even find a lump until probably the very, very end, but it was, it was enormous by that time. And then um, had the organ deck to me out. And then the big, the big debate was, you know, there was almost, if they thought um, no ret testy invasion, but it was still very close in certain areas is what the pathology said. And so because of that, because of the size factor of the testy and because of my schedule that I'm back and forth between the US a lot and, 
and constant checkups maybe wouldn't be the easiest at times. We lent for the decision to go for the, for the one dose of carboplatin in, in January. I had the uh just, just a bit later than mid-November. And, um, yeah. and so I had the one dose. Uh, it wasn't and what right. was that like? Think... What was that like going through this? Did that set you back much? I mean, you're obviously super it did a little doing bit. a lot of weights. And were you able to train through that and stuff or not? Uh, I, I, that one, I'd be honest, that one knocked me a little bit. But I think it was probably because I deconditioned so much from the surgery. And then I had, what is it, six, like at least eight weeks or so post-surgery until eventually you go and I had Christmas and I wasn't training because I was kind of tired and waiting to see and, and still recovering and so waiting to see. So I kind of hit that one probably not in peak condition. So it actually yeah. did affect me reasonably. I, I felt a little bit like hungover for about five, six days. And then it took me a while to sort of get back into shape and get feeling normal and weird things. Like the first time I went back in the sun, I got like my skin peeled and then like just, just things like that, that I was so sunburned, not even from being out in the sun, but I just noticed my skin it just yeah. seemed to knock me back for a while. And it took me a while to, and I went straight back into working and on the road. Um, and so it made it a lot harder, I'd say, to fight, fully get back to my sort of full health. I, I, I didn't find like any real side effects other than it probably just slowed me down. Um, it probably just slowed me down and made yeah. me a little bit um, emotional as such at, at, at the time. Yeah. but. I don't know. They say there's a little bit of hormone imbalance that can happen with, with, with the drug as well. And so I did feel a little bit like that yeah. for a little while. Um, but, but on the whole, it wasn't until I had actually the break from COVID and being locked down for, say, five months or four months or such that I trained every day. I ate extremely healthy and I felt like I got back into sort of peak condition. Because that's when we, yeah, I mean, the, there was the beginning of the COVID. They were, I think, Sky and NBC and people were looking for some things. And, and I had a minor role in when you started telling your, you did a little piece on telling your story. And obviously you were um, getting back to, to fitness there. And I should also mention as well, I mean, uh, congratulations on getting engaged this year. Um, for those uh, rugby players uh, who, who know, some of them will. But uh, Alex is, uh, is engaged to Abby Gustadis. Uh, and Abby is the captain of the ladies, uh, American ladies uh, uh, sevens uh, rugby team. And uh, does she does she play seven or does she play prop? What does she? Uh, she plays and, she plays prop in sevens. Uh, yeah. But she would never let me call her a prop. Uh, no, in, I was in real say, life. No, so she she so, she played um she's played in fifty she played in the twenty seventeen fifteens World Cup for the United States. Yeah. And she played a, a bit of second row, but only because she's almost six foot and there's not many yeah. uh, you know so females at that height that want to so play in second back row. Yeah, but she's more back of a back, back row and has played a bit of 13 as well. I think her best rugby at 15 is at 13, just because her, her passing's mean, mate. Her passing is I, where it's I, To be honest, I, I fancy myself as a, as a 13 or blindside or second yeah, row, but I think mainly exactly. second row. She's that sort of utility, <laughs> but it's mainly her skill set, which, um, yeah, her passing's way better Great. than mine. She, she likes to remind me often, but we've done a fair bit of uh, skills coaching together uh, through Fantastic. COVID as well. So it, it kept me busy. So you were kind of convalescing uh, then, obviously, or back to full fitness with her. Sadly, the Olympics got cancelled, so that must have been a big moment. I know you guys are really looking forward to uh, going out to the Olympics uh, next year. Hopefully that, that, all, that all happens and you can support her there. It must have been really nice, actually, because you're in San Diego, are you? Is that where you... Yeah, at that time we are in San Diego. So I usually travel a lot back and forth between here and the UK, but at that point, because it was locked down and travel didn't seem like it was going to be... Mm you know, open for a while or unsure of what it was going to be like for a while. And there was no work or sport on either side. Uh, I decided to stay there with her. And you I know, think I would, have, I would have taken San Diego uh, over, uh, over, the, over, the, over the British <laughs> summer, I would say, any day. It, it, exactly. And uh, it, was, it wasn't a bad place to be. We had a lot of time together. Uh, we didn't quite kill each other at times, which no. was good. But um, well, on a whole, it gave me a chance. Like, it, it was nice to be there with her and support her through, which, is, which was a heartbreaking time of having the Olympics postponed and not being able to train as a team for at least four or five months. Uh, yeah. The uncertainty. And, and when you know Olympic athlete, like as much as rugby is a full-time commitment, we have year-on-year -year lots of events. The, these girls have, or ladies have sacrificed a lot. They've all got university degrees, all, all putting their lives on hold to try and go to these Olympics. Well, they train so in a cycle, that, don't they? Yeah, it's like yeah, a four-year so cycle. Yeah, so to have that postponed, so I really, my heart goes big... out to any. Any, any Olympic athletes, it's very, very tough pill to take at the moment. And there's still a cloud of uncertainty over what exactly the Olympics next year is going to look like. I'm well, hoping format, it will yeah. go on in some form of capacity. And if I'm able to go support, I will 1,000% be there. But that was it. Like with COVID then, 
I ended well, if you up need getting... a urologist, I'm sure there'll be a plenty of urologists <laughs> who will uh, hap happily travel with you for uh, any it, occasional uh, Exactly. Backup. And um, and that was the thing. I just used COVID to get back in shape. I, I think yeah. I, I allowed myself to get a little heavier. Everything after, you said, 124 kilos. I probably got up to about 132. And by the end of COVID, I was back down to 115, 116 and feeling like okay. back to my playing fitness as such. And yeah. then... Um, and then it all kind and of then you uh, contacted you know, me. Yeah, you, you contacted me, I think, in sort of July, was it July, August time and said that you were having some some back pain. You talked about a sort of you obviously you're much more body aware than me. You're talking specifically about a psoas muscle exercise that you were doing and that you had a role and that it was just causing pain. Just tell me what 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 exactly so, happened. There. Yes. So exactly. So what happens is I always use this um especially because I travel a lot, usually this thing called like a so it's a PSO. And it's like this little plastic thing that you lay on that trigger points your front psoas and kind of releases that. And that would help my back, hip mobility, um, a lifetime of rugby and, and sort of oldness. But a lot of time it would come on when I would be sitting in planes, traveling for work and stuff. And so, you know, I use that every day. I was feeling great. And then we went on holiday with uh, my missus to see her family in Maryland, spent a week there, was training, everything was fine. Then we went to um, Miami and, and stayed down there, um, our family there and stuff. And we were down there. And so that was probably about the two week point where I hadn't used that psoas stretch. And yeah. all of a sudden I started getting these, um, I was getting a, a nerve, like nerve tingling here in like the front of my thigh, like a rat and around my scar where the orchomdectomy was. My back was like twi like nerve twitching mm. a little bit. And I was getting these sharp pains in my stomach. Like I thought, Google doctor convinced myself I had diver, diverticulitis or something because nice. <laughs> I, it, was, it was it was it was it was sharp pain and it was and it lasted for a few days and it was agony and then all of a sudden gradually it started to improve and when I got back to California I was using that psoas and stretching and it went away and I thought oh, it must have been some sort of stomach thing or whatever but it was always kind of around but not quite bad and then and that was like July fourth kind of time and then yeah. I eventually, uh, about three weeks later, whatever, went back to the UK, see my family, to come back for checkups and everything as the world was slowly opening up a little bit again. And what happened then was, is at about the two week mark from being away from home again and not having that tool with me because I didn't want to travel with it. It takes up suitcase space, but in hindsight, it was dumb. Um, all of a sudden, I started getting those pains again, but they were probably yeah. two or three times worse. And it was quite excruciating to the point that I, I was bedridden and i if you told me my appendix was bursting on the other side uh, if it hadn't been on the other side i would have believed you from the pain like and i have quite a high pain threshold but yeah well i'm sure it was quite yeah, i mean it was quite debilitating so i rang you and i said hey like this is what's going on what do you think i'm coming in for my bloods and my routine checkup with with dr sarah rudman and what do you expect and 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 you spoke to sarah and, and my understanding was that that was kind of the catalyst that decided to ct me then and not yeah. what was going to probably be later down the line. Well, if people have a symptom that could be related to something that's with you know you know linked to the disease, I think it's uh, I, I think yeah obviously it was it was it was the right call because you then that CT showed a three and a half I think four centimeter lymph node mass that was basically left paraaortic right over the the origin of the psoas muscle, so it, it kind of all made sense I think and uh, um, and then and that, obviously that must have been a, a you know I suppose useful really good to know that that you weren't making this pain up but also a big blow to know that you then have to go back and and have the chemo no exactly um you know of all the things when dr sarah uh, when dr rudman uh called me i i didn't expect it to say that my cancer was back i i i think i thought it might have been something that was wrong with my intestines or something that they might have seen or or something but in my head yeah. sort of the the cancer being back, mainly because I felt so good. I was fit. I was strong. I was in shape of my sort of retirement life, which has been almost five years for rugby now. And I yeah. reckon as good a shape it is as I was for parts of my career. And um, so the last thing I thought was that it was back. And so when, when I got the phone call that it was a four centimeter or basically 3.8 or four centimeter enlarged and it was sitting on the psoas, one, it made sense because that kind of my understanding yeah. where the psoas is and, and some people even stretch it for digestion issues and stuff. So it kind of lined up. And two, I, as, as you know, it took about four or five days to get my head around the fact to absorb it and to realize I'm going back to the UK now and I'm going to be here for a while and it's going to be, you know, nine weeks of, of BEP is what was subscribed. But on the other, other side, I also thought, 
you know, I'm incredibly lucky. I think I caught this now because the plan was probably not to scan till November otherwise. And the fact that yeah. it was already there in, in early August, where might have it spread to by November? Because yeah. I had the carbo eight, Yeah. Yeah, because I had the carbo platen as well. It had obviously moved quite quickly still, which was what happened to the initial uh, testi st testicle grew quite quickly in a short period of time. So, you know, in my mind, I was like, you know, in some ways it's a blessing and, and, and you know, let's get back there and, and sort of bring it on. Yeah, and then that, it sounds, I mean, you're, you've always been so positive through this, but I mean, Abby wasn't with you at that time. So you, you must have had to make that pretty nasty phone call then to, to say, to explain what was going on and your folks are here so you had this yeah. you were staying with them as well so. no i was back i was back in san diego at this point so i was already back because i okay. thought that and and It'll i because i didn't expect it was going to be bad news sure. and i had to get back for nbc was starting um the premiership nice season seat. so i had to get back to do my first show there because it was uh we'd set up a remote studio in our house and and that's the way they're doing a lot of our rugby under covid and everything is all remotely and so I got back and then I got the phone call and then I had to go down and tell Abby. And it was, you know, she was just shocked, really. And uh, it takes a while. To, and then I had to tell my parents and then I had to get on that plane on my own and, and get back over there. And then had a week or so, 10 days in the UK and whatever. And then I had to do oh, two weeks or so because I had to do the COVID testing and the swabs and the self-isolation. And then we were able to start the, um, the treatment. And uh, yeah, no, it, it's... Yeah. Well, it's Listen, been interesting I, with the COVID as well. I mean, just mentioning that because it's something, I mean, obviously we're now faced with again with the second wave is that we were very determined that one group of men we didn't want to, to delay treatment for was, was people needing chemotherapy for testis. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that's actually been borne out. I don't know if uh, Sarah Rudman will know these, these figures, but we've not had any real issue. So it has been with the self-isolation and the testing. It, it has worked. And I mean, just... We want to get onto the good stuff and talk about uh, talk about your rugby career in a, in, a, in a second. But just to finish up on that, you've, you're, you're you're almost through those three cycles of BEP now. I, I just finished last last yeah. week was my last yeah. was my last treatment, so, and so great. Um, physically, you know, it, it had its moments where it got quite quite tough. Um, I learned in the first sort of th third week or so that you know I, I had a bit of an off stomach in it. And a little bit of, um, you know, I had stomach and I didn't get sick, but I had sort of diarrhea and I, I didn't tell them because I thought it was nothing. And it turned out I ended up having some sort of stomach bacterial infection. Yeah. And when I came in on the Monday for treatment, they almost said I could have died. Bactocampa, I think I believe is what I had. Campylo, yeah, Campylobacter, <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, and I, I just got that from a chicken breast, apparently. And all my other family were fine. And and I apparently, you know, and you realize then your immune system's not great. And then I got the only thing as well as the bleomycin would give me quite a, a sore throat um, just in one spot. Like some people get blisters in the mouth, I read, but it's the same spot when I used to play rugby. If I got run down, that would get, it would be the first awesome. place that, yeah, really? the first place that would be sore. And so the bleo That's... seemed to hit that spot almost every time by the second month, uh, second or third Monday, I would, it would always be like a, a sore in the back of my throat. And did you have tingling in the hands? Did you have any any of that? Numbness no, no tingling? tingling in the hands and fingers, but I had a lot of ringing in the ears. Um, that yeah. high frequency ear ringing, you know, just sitting here like uh, it could be now and all of a sudden it's like someone's turning that sort of frequency dial up. And, you know, the first couple of times I was looking around to see if anyone else could hear it. And then uh, eventually <laughs> I realized, you know, it's just me. And this is what they're talking yeah. about. I had I had hearing tests at the beginning and, and everything. And yeah, I, I don't think it was any... The audio audiometry didn't you at the beginning and they, yeah. do, the, they do the gfr and uh to, to check the maximum dose and uh and and now i mean presumably on, onwards and upwards really i mean exactly be... i'm improving every day um i think physically i'm getting back into it one of the things i think i did which you know other people go through this um i don't think to that maybe I, I could have overdone it at times but i think keeping exercising in some form is very important um, yeah. I, th I think other than on the heavy weeks where you're in five days a week, uh, every day for five, six hours, like those weeks I didn't really exercise other than I walked to the hospital from Waterloo station, um, and yeah. then would usually, and whatever. And so, but, but on the other weeks, I would at least try and exercise at least, you know, a couple times a week, nothing crazy, never more than half an hour, maybe sit on a bike, light body weight circuit or something. But I did find that just like push up, sit up, squat, something like that, you know, nothing crazy, but something that just kept 
ticking case. over and I find that helped a lot with the treatment and, and the even my, yeah. my sickness as well. Well, I was going to ask you whether being a professional sportsman you think has in some way helped get your mind around this and having a sort of program of rehab and you're used to rehabbing from injuries. So this is just sort of rehabbing from a massive body insult in a way. And you've, you know, obviously we all go, wow, doing squats and stuff. But, you know, that's what you do. Your, your life is being super fit. So, you know, it's... Exactly. Even... And I just found even mentally as well as physically doing a little something felt quite good. I think otherwise you're just sitting around doing nothing and feeling horrible all the time. Yeah. And, um, and the one, yeah, and like, I just even get a lot of hangover nausea, especially in those heavy weeks. The lighter weeks weren't too bad. But then the thing I found the hardest that started affecting me was the masks. Um, because with COVID, it's five, six hours in a chair wearing a mask all the time. By the, by the sort of sixth or seventh week, every time I put a mask on, it would make me gag or think about the, the yeah. feeling or the treatment. And I don't know how much of it was physical, how much was mental, but... Um, a lot of time, by the time I got to the hospital, I, I sometimes puked a couple of times just because I've been wearing it on the train the whole way. And then I yeah, yeah. put on the actual hospital one that smelled of alcohol. And that was actually, for me, one of the harder things I found was just actually on the days I had to go in later on wearing the mask. When I was at home, the thing I love the most about those lighter weeks is I would have a week without having to put a mask on. The relief of that. In. Yeah. Yeah. That would give me a, a lot of relief. Well, we're, um, I, well, I think all of us in the urology a community can uh, can empathize with that of course uh, we've uh, yeah, not the same imagine. amount of nausea but uh, yeah our life is walking every building every day for whatever it has been now six seven months but look alex if you would if you were, would um uh, uh, allow me um let's just talk rugby for a moment can we uh, 100 i've got i've got this amazing opportunity i can ask you some some stuff about uh, things i've always wanted to ask a uh, someone who's played for the british lions in england um so you, um, what was your best ever uh, victory in, in rugby? Was it, I'm thinking it was probably the Lions, but you, got, you, won, the, you won the championship as well. What, what was your best victory? I would say the Lions. Uh, I've won a Six Nations, won a Premiership, um, been to World Cup, but there's nothing like a Lions tour uh, and nothing like a third test decider and it all on the line and away from home and you've got more, more fans than, than, the, than the home team because there's sort of sea of red travel there and all that was on the line and the fact you got to play with players like um, Brian O'Driscoll, Paul O'Connell, Sam Warburton, Johnny Sexton, Tommy Bow, Owen Farrell, like I could carry on, um, Adam and Jones, you know, like uh, Adam Jones, like it was, it was like a childhood dream all rolled into one. And then the fact when the third yeah. test came down, I had a big role to play. And I think I, I, it was probably the, the biggest occasion of my career. And it was probably my most complete performance. I thought um, yeah, yeah. 70 odd, three minutes, whoever was on the field, I didn't really make any mistakes. I'm usually very hypercritical of myself. There's always things I feel like I could do better. Um, a lot of people remember that game for the try scored in the first five minutes. Uh, the try means almost nothing to me. It just is the start of an, a great performance. And the fact that like, it was right place, right time, and a good involvement leading up to that point. But really, it was just the, the com completeness of the performance, like all my little jobs, yeah. my work rate in defense, the scrum, the, the annihilation of Ben Alexander after he'd sort of mugged us off on the second test. Um, I wasn't playing because I had a tweak calf in that test. The first game, test, I played quite well against him, but I pulled my calf in the warm-up. So I felt like I didn't quite get to put my best performance in that one where we still dominated, but I left, let him off the hook a little. Mako Bonapola was sort of my understudy then. In the second game of that time, he hadn't quite reached the level of world class he's at now. And, yeah. so, and he just sort of got street smarted a little bit by Ben Alexander, and it cost us the game tough penalties and when you're in a tight game at international level yeah. all those little penalties are free entries to the 22 their points their pressure they add up so if you are dominant in that area it can really be a way of like breaking the dam or, bur or bursting the dam in a team with accumulated pressure over a long period of time and so um the ability in that game to go out there and do that probably is my best moment and there's one thing that yeah. always stands with me is that day it was probably one of the longest days of my life we didn't kick off to, i think almost 9 p.m so the time it would be on in the well, UK. Well, that's so that we could all get up and have a morning breakfast and watch it. it. Exactly. And so, you know, you're waiting around all day. Uh, we started at our hotel in, in Sydney and then we actually moved to a hotel right next to the ground because it's about an hour and a bit away with traffic to the Olympic Stadium in Sydney. And Gats didn't want to sit on a long bus ride before we played. So uh, just about to head to that hotel, to the next one, get on the bus. Uh, I'm going for water in the breakfast room. I see Warren Gatlin. We're literally getting a water at the same time. He just looks at me and goes, I apologize. He goes, will you get that prick for me today? And I said, Gats, I'll get him, mate. I'll get him for you. And then as soon as that game was over, 
one of the things I was most excited about was running and seeing Gats. We were on the field when we'd won the third test and I saw him and I said, I told you I'd get him for you. And he just hugged me and loved it. Oh. And Half Penny got man of the match in that day and, and he deserved it. He, he was one of the players of the tournament. But when Gats said in the after match that I was his man of the match, I just knew why. Because he gave me yeah. that task that day yeah. and I just, I, I just, I delivered for him. And, and as a player, that was one of my, the best things is I, yeah. I loved having coaches that invested in you and I, I was so invested in the team. So when you had that sort of relationship, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was sometimes where I played my best rugby. No, well, we can only smile, but I mean, the uh, the thought of, of that, I mean, it is boyhood dreams, isn't it? Going on a Lions tour, getting injured for the second, coming back for the third, and then being yeah. absolutely fundamental to the to the victory in the, in yeah, the third. Yeah, no, I'm undefeated in Lions. I, I always say I got some great stats, even though I, I missed a lot of games with injury. I'm undefeated in Lions tests. I'm undefeated against the All Blacks. I only played them once in 2012 and we beat them. <laughs> played 1-1-1. So one, one, one. That's good. Yeah. So that must, have, that must said, have been a good victory as well. I mean, that, 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 was, was, that, was, that best, was that your best England victory? I'd say it was the best victory because obviously, like, what an upset that was, do you know? Like, yeah. at the time, they hadn't lost in well over a year. They're world champions, best team in the world, like, absolute legends everywhere. No one gave us a shot. And we went yeah. out there and, and for 80 minutes, we made everything difficult for them. And, and again, scrum, pressure, everything builds. And as the game went on, the dam burst. And, you know, that game was close at half time. But by the second half, similar to the Lions test, they were close at half time. And the second half, you, we, you, the pressure and that, that pressure and the points and the it all accumulates. And finally, the dam bursts and you run away with it. And so it was a pretty yeah. fitting day for me. The only thing is I had some bad memories of that game is that I didn't, I should never have played it. I, my knee was in such a bad way, but Roundtree and, and Lancaster sat me down and said they needed me. Um, Marla was injured. Mako wasn't ready yet. This is the year before the Lions. Um, and, and they said, they, they need you. And I, and I said, all right, I'll play. Um, and I played that game, but I, I was in excruciating pain. And I, did, I still played very, like, very well because I kind of played like there was no tomorrow because we play in the All Blacks at Twickenham with swing low, rose in your chest. They do the hacker at the beginning. Yeah. I was, no there, places I was there, I was there. I remember there's it. No, it was immense. There's no places for poor me, you know, like, oh, oh, God, my knee's bad. So I just went out there and just got on with it. But then I didn't play again for five months after that game. Because I needed of that, a, a because surgery. Yeah. yeah. They told me that they would give me a cortisone the next week and then have a few weeks rest and rehab. And then I would get back into it. But unfortunately, um, unfortunately, that wasn't the case. I ended up needing five months, yeah. uh, a surgery, multiple cortisones, rehab. And it cost me a start, like a starting spot on the lions because i missed the whole six nations and, yeah you were almost so you were almost i, I wasn't the picked tour. initially and i just got back in time for the end of the season to get on the england tour and was playing well like i trained the whole time like i was going on the lions and that was my mindset was you know if you get your shot there's always a lions call up that shocks everyone and i just kind of told myself in the dark moments that is what i'm training for i'm going on that tour somehow if they get the call i'm yeah. going to be ready and so that game sometimes sits in my mind as you know not as you know, sweet a moment as possible just because I had that attached to it. And then the other game that probably is, is that Ireland 2012 uh, Six Nations win where we, at home, where we just decimated them in the scrum at scrum time. And um, we got a penalty try at the scrum, a penalty try at Twickenham against Key and Healy, uh, you know, and all that, and uh, uh, Rory Best and, yeah. you know, players like that. Uh, Donico and Callahan in the row, like they had a good team out. Yeah. Sean O'Brien, seriously good playing. players, yeah, yeah. And um, and the and the real reason I know I actually know some of the questions you're gonna ask me, someone what was my worst moment or toughest moment or opponent on the field? And and the reason why I love that 2012 game so much is because in 2011, it'd been my first Six Nations, I'd, I'd played um, three games, I missed the first one, but then Sheridan got injured and I got my chance to start for England and then. Played three games. I was part of the youngest front row ever with um, myself, Dylan Hartley and Dan Cole at the time. Um, and against Nicola Mass, against Scotland, um, you know, against Italy with Castro Giovanni and then we'd scrum very well. And so we were on for a grand slam. The last game was in Dublin, 2011. Um, I think we'd already won the Six Nations, but we were playing for the grand slam. Yeah. And um, biggest game at the time of my career and we got blown away. Uh, we walked into a storm in Dublin and a lot of it started from scrum penalties. It was the same front row, Mike Ross, uh, Rory Best, Kean Healy. And, you know, they did a job on us and it was really my fault. Like as much as I, you know, it, it, it was probably one of the harder pills to swallow as a young player. You know, you're just 
so happy to be there, be part of England. At that point so far, it had all gone well, hadn't lost a game. And then you run into that tough day at the office where really the, the spark that lighted their intensity and their fuel, which at the biggest, the highest level, the set piece is massive, was the scrum. And so I spent all year remembering that, learning from it. Like it haunted yeah. me, but it also helped make me into probably, I would say, what at the time, a world-class scrummager because I never wanted to feel like that again. And so when the time we had them the next year at Twickenham, it was absolutely game on. Like I remember looking at Dylan and Coley and we had Graham Rounds, who is now our forwards coach, who was our scrum coach then. It, different ball game. He goes, look at the work you've done. And, and we just said, it's our house. It's our house this time. It's different. It's going to be different. Amazing. And we absolutely blitzed them. And I know first three or four scrums happened. Mike Ross was under pressure. And I said, it's coming all day. And the next scrum, he went off injured. And I knew, I knew it was just mentally as well that they weren't, <laughs> it didn't mean to them what it meant to us because of the year before. Like, and sometimes yeah. that desire and everything means more. And I'll never forget it. We're, we're absolutely rolling. I'm scrum after scrum on the line. Swing low is beckoning through Twickenham. And, you know, we get to that final scrum where we're rolling them over the line. And I look down and I see Key and Healy sort of on the floor facing the wrong way. I see Dylan Hartley knee him <laughs> square in the head. And then we march over the line and score and embrace each other. And to me, I thought, had it been for the Lions, I would say that is the best moment of my Aww. career. Because... Like that's the only, the Lions, the only thing that took it, but that's as close as I think you could get to that Lions game is that England v. Ireland and, and just seeing like, I love Keane. I think he's one of the best. All right. Don't speak about his, don't time. speak about treading on him anymore. I know Hartley would have any no, of that, man. No, that but is... yeah, but Dylan just banged him with a nice knee on the way. And it was just like, it was poetic justice for us as a, as a three. And it, yeah, the photos after of us hugging each other, you just see the emotion of what it means. Well, I think I'm going to have to go back and watch some of these. Uh, I want to rewatch some of these games. But look, I literally could talk rugby with you yeah, uh, me too. all, get, all day. Get... It's so it's so lovely to see. I mean, you know that that passion, that that emotion. With that, we can only uh, you know we are we are in awe of you. But look, just to finish off, uh, Alex, if we could, um, um, this is the Urology Foundation lecture. And you and me and Louise de Winter, who is the CEO of the Urology Foundation, have had a, a chat recently. And just tell us what, you, what you're planning. You, you've got some work to, to, to do some fundraising for Tough. Um, and no, what, what is the idea? Exactly. Um, I think obviously getting involved with you and the Urology Foundation and, and the help that you and everyone has been able to provide for me and the service of the NHS has been incredible. Um, I, I feel very motivated to try and make a, a huge positive or, or, or a silver lining out of what's been a tough yeah. year or so and so for me this is something that's very close to my heart um my, my dad had testicular cancer at 28 my uncle had it at 29 yeah that's um, just amazing i've had this at, at 32 31 now 32 um and so for me i am raising funds t for a urology uh for, for a team corp sort of urology research grant which is is going to be hopefully aimed at you know a full research grant but the goal is to eventually ra raise enough for a phd or, or something in it it's yeah. a is to look more into testicular cancer and areas that we've highlighted is you know earlier diagnostic um it, diagnosis yeah. of, of being able to pick it up or whether there's a gene relation obviously with you know some of the things in my family at, at the moment my understanding is there's no sort of gene or anything isolated that puts you more at risk or that you might carry that makes you more um you know more susceptible or more likely yeah. to have this disease and then the other thing that i do believe as well is is that Chemo obviously isn't the end of the world, but it's very invasive for, for young men and the, and the potential risk of, you know, going infertile and the disruption to your life, um, potential alternative treatment pathways that maybe don't involve this, but also might be linked in with getting an earlier diagnosis as well. So that's, yeah, so that is, yeah, two areas there. I mean, we, uh, so I think we're going to try and go for £60,000 for the yep, Alex Cabiziero a uh, team Corbs uh, fundraiser. Um, I've already generated a, a, a group of a group of uh, people who are going to do a bike ride specifically for this in May, and people are registering. And we can there's going to be stuff on the Tough website. On the Tough website, your foundation and is is all linked to that. And then hopefully we'll have a call then for interested researchers. And I say it would be lovely to have you involved with the selection. It would be so Completely. great. You're going to be such a great advocate for the charity. And that between us. Uh, with Grant Stewart, who's that professor, who's the head of uh, um, the, the academic side of Tough, we'll, we'll select some good researchers and, and we'll actually make some difference to the di disease. And that, I think, you know, is a really good go, you know, give back, isn't it? Completely. I think it's going to be a lasting legacy. And 
you know, I have a younger brother. Uh, there's men that are going to follow after me that go through this. And the fact that if I can make this into something where we've made the road for them easier to travel or, or we help, you know, prevent a lot of people going down the harder road that doesn't maybe doesn't need to be gone down, it will be... Um, it will be so worthwhile. And, and, and I think um, I really appreciate your support. I appreciate everyone that's going to apply. And, you know, I, yeah. I'm just, I'm just, it just means a lot to me. And, and I'm, I've already been raising no. money through selling my team Corbs t-shirts, where all the profits go. We've yeah, already we made $5,000. We've, we've made $5,000 that are going towards this grant. And, and you know, yeah. we're going to do the bike ride organized and I'm going to be doing some other challenges when I get fully healthy again and allowed to go back in the outside world. And I think, you know, give us a bit of time, but we're going to put together something that hopefully allows people to apply and, and help make a difference in this field. Great. Well, Alex Corbiziero, thank you so much for being the Urology Foundation uh, lecturer uh, this year, 2020, for our guest lecture. Uh, it's been great chatting with you. Uh, if we can put any, you know, if we can try and generate the amount of passion that you've just told us about from the rugby, and we put that passion into raising money for tough for this amazing cause, that will be a wonderful thing. So thank you for your time and thank you for speaking to us. No, absolutely. Thank you for everyone. And, and thank you, Ben, and everyone, uh, guys, for all the help they've given me as well. I'm grateful. Our pleasure.